Welcome back to CivilNet. We're almost at the conclusion of two days of coverage of events in Vilnius that are going to impact all of us uh, globally, regionally, and certainly here in Armenia. The second day of the Civil Society Summit is almost over. We've been watching a session on Ukraine, which is now not the associated member, but the non-associated partner of the European Union, and we will continue with coverage throughout the evening. This is the second to last panel that you will be seeing. Of course, the summit has just ended. The actual summit where the presidents uh, agreed to a political declaration. The Armenian president was there. Nothing was signed, although many of us over these last several months and years were hoping that this would be the day when, in fact, Armenia too would pre-sign the association agreement with the European Union. You can continue, of course, to watch the Civil Society Forum live, or you might want to join us here, where my guest is the head of the European Union delegation to Armenia, Ambassador Tryon Hersteya, who has been working very hard over this last year, year and a half of his term, and who has now brought us over these last several months of discussion back and forth since September 3 to try to figure out what it is we did, where do we go from here, what does Europe expect of us. Ambassador, welcome to CivilNet. Today we've come, we here in Armenia, we, those of us watching these uh, international discussions, have kind of come to a couple of conclusions and I want to throw them at you and, and, and you tell me whether you think we're on the right path or not. One of them is that we think that we were counting on you and you were counting on you to push this process of democratization forward. And it didn't happen through your efforts the way we wished. We wished you were doing, you'd do the heavy lifting, you'd bring us a thousand pages, you'd make our government and our institutions and our civil society start checking them off. It didn't happen. Now, we can't count on this external sort of support. We gotta do it ourselves. You think we're right? Is that the right conclusion? Well, um, I'm very happy that uh, finally the civil society engaged in a debate about uh, this kind of different models of development that are on the table right now. Um, I think uh, this is a good opportunity really to develop that debate and to discuss uh, and to see how it is going to happen into the future. Uh, as they say in the Latin countries, you know, vox populi vox dei. Uh, the voice of people is the voice of God. So I think that uh, from that perspective, what you saw in Ukraine uh, is a model of democracy in action and in reaction to the decisions that were taken up. Um, when it comes uh, to uh, Armenia, uh, you mentioned these thousand pages that we were ready to uh, bring it here. Yes, we are ready to bring it here. We negotiated in good faith, uh, but the decision of a sovereign country has to be respected. And this is what the European Union does. Uh, you saw it also today uh, during the summit and the positions that have been expressed by all the leaders uh, present in Vilnius and um, the decision was there. And I think this is what differentiates European Union as opposed to some other uh, big uh, geopolitical players. Which we always, uh, I'm leaving it uh, to yourself. Uh, and that is the, the, the biggest difference. We do respect the sovereign decision of the countries. Uh, and when we say that we do respect the sovereign decision of the countries, it means that we do respect the sovereign decisions of the people. Uh, and I do believe that uh, Armenia will find itself into the future with the best choice it has decided. That seems to be one of the areas where perhaps the European leadership miscalculated, perhaps it was a cultural clash. The natural assumption is that you talk leader to leader, you talk elites to elites, you talk representatives to representatives. Perfectly natural sounding conclusion. Except that in countries like ours, in countries like Ukraine, and not just the two of us, but specifically in this case, it's not always that the those in office represent, reflect, protect, uh, understand, share the interests of the public. And in this case, some of us at least are saying that perhaps this is a failure of insufficient dialogue and buy-in 
from the public level, that the conversation and the expectations for agreement can't just remain between Europe and our leadership, because our leadership isn't like your leadership. Is that an unfair conclusion, that these negotiations, if that's what they are and if that's what they will be going forward, that they really need to also take place in some way with society, civil society, not just the leaders? Well, um, you can say how, of course. Well, that would have been my first attempt <laughs> to uh, to respond by really invoking the procedural aspects of negotiations. We negotiate based on mandate and based on the uh, expression of the political will that is uh, represented by the government. Um, this is not to say that uh, we have to engage now in a kind of a legitimacy conversation. Is this government legitimate or not? Is not my job. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. Um, what I want to say is about that regardless of the decision that was taken in September 3rd, Armenia will remain an uh, Eastern Partnership uh, country. And the whole exercise of the Eastern Partnership is based on values, is based on commitments, and it's based on values and commitments that are commonly shared both by the EU member states, but also by the beneficiary states of the Eastern Partnership. Whether some decisions are going in one direction or another, that remains to be seen. Because the um, reform efforts uh, and the uh, promotion of democracy, human rights, fight against corruption, the value part that is commonly shared will stay regardless the integration decision that is taken. Uh -huh. um, so here I think the European Union has a kind of a positive uh, competitive advantage because the association processes with all uh, the countries that pass through this association process validated its rightness and validated its result. Uh, I, I would be uh, very happy to uh, recall some figures, if you want, uh, figures that were indicating practically a tremendous increase in terms of trade, tremendous increase in terms of GDP per capita, tremendous increase in the uh, way in which the business and the political decision is, is taken. And uh, last but not least, uh, which I would say is the most important, a tremendous shift in the mentalities. Yeah, we've been saying this all day. That, you know, and uh, uh, uh -huh. I would say that uh, if all this process is kept on these values that are commonly shared, I don't think the hope should be lost. Yeah, and I think that, well, cur certainly we have no room to lose hope because otherwise we won't work and we have work to do. But certainly, even without the numbers, if we just look, and we've been doing this for two days now, if we just look at Ukraine and its neighbor Poland, similar, similar in so many ways, and yet look at GDP today, look at level of prosperity, look at level of democratization. So. I don't think the question is in being convinced that the European value-based reforms, whether economic or political, can only help our development. The question is how do we do it, how do we collectively, uh, how do, we collectively do the difficult things, the difficult reforms, which of course Poland did do in order to achieve its current status. How do we do that and how do we do it without falling off of Europe's agenda? The uh, speech by President von Rompuy today was really interesting. Uh, of course he welcomed Georgia and Moldova, but he began by this elaborate thanks to Azerbaijan for signing visa facilitation, which of course we signed, I don't know, six months, eight months ago. And, and ratified recently. And ratified recently. And yet we didn't earn a place there. And my interpretation of it, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, is that this is what happens when perceptions change. This is when the country ceases to be viewed as a uh, reliable partner and is viewed with, at the very least, questions about, you know, what do these guys really want, and so forth. Am I right? Well, I will challenge your uh, question by saying that uh, this is what is hap when is happening when you, you base your judgment on perceptions only. Uh -huh. 
because the facts are a little bit different. Uh, in the European Union's view, all the six member uh, beneficiary states of the Eastern Partnership um, are, in terms of values and approach, approach is equal, because it's an equal partnership. Of course, uh, each and every country uh, gears its relations with the European Union based on um, the principle more for more and the differentiation that was agreed in the last summit. And this is continue to explain be the case more into more. the future. We say it a lot, but we don't explain it. Please explain So that. the countries will get much more engaged and the European Union will en engage more those countries that are delivering much uh, more. Elaborate, uh, in an elaborate way uh, on the ways of the transformation and reforms. Um, and this is continuing to be the case, as I hope the uh, summit uh, will show by its uh, political declaration uh, that it's uh, going to be adopted during the summit. Um, to come back to, to what you said, uh, I would uh, even underline more. Um, it is important to um, remember the track record. And um, I think this is what we have to do now, from Which now track on, record? the track record of the negotiations, the track uh -huh. record of the transformations. And I do believe that by um, the political declaration adopted at the uh, summit level, uh, and I do believe that by the uh, exchange of letters that was done between uh, High Representative and Vice President Ashton and uh, Foreign Minister Nalbandian, uh, together with a, a joint statement that the two personalities, uh, Ashton and Albandian, uh, um, uh, adopted and uh, issued uh, on the occasion of the summit, um, we could outline into the future how it can be done. Of course, our preference is for the same recipe, political association, economic integration and mobility in a safe and securely managed environment, mm -hmm. but um, uh, what we put in those documents, to a certain extent, it's a normal continuation under the new political consequences and circumstances. So I do believe that we still have ahead a wonderful road to be together and to accompany Armenia in the efforts to continue the reforms. You're a good diplomat. And you're saying on the one hand exactly what we want to hear, that you're not going anywhere, you're still there. If Armenia is willing, you're willing. There is life after Vilnius. There is life after Vilnius. On the other hand, um, as we listen to the way that the European leadership is coming down on Ukraine, pretty hard on Yanukovych, uh, on expectations from the next president and so forth, it's very, very different from the way in which Armenia, Armenia's leadership is being judged. Perhaps it's because it's two months old already, it's, it's old. Um, perhaps it's because Armenia doesn't count the same in the geopolitical formula. But it's surprising. We're not, we're, it's almost like we're getting away with it again. Well, first and foremost, I want to tell you that the European Union doesn't think in terms of geopolitics. It thinks in terms of values. And this is going to happen also into the future. So I think this is uh, one of the differences, uh, as I said before characterizes the European Union as compared to some other actors. Um, we keep in mind, of course, the sovereign decision of the country. Um, and uh, I don't think that the European Union was harsh on Ukraine, because this is what we put for up front. We put the values and we put the discussion with the society. So, of course, this is an expectation and is a standard which does exist within the European Union, is a standard that does exist in the politics and policies by the European Union with any partner state, and that will be the case into the future with all the members of the, all the partners of the European Union. Well, even though we are not a partner in the way in which we want it to have been by the end of today, we still do have those thousand pages, don't we? I hope we have, and I'm quite sure that by this exchange of, let of letters that it happened today, this will be a very important reference point for the future activities. Thank you. Thank you for your You're optimism. Welcome. Thank you for your continuing support. Uh, you both individually and your delegation have done a great deal over these months and years to bring us to this point, and now we're going to see what we can do to move it forward ourselves. Thank you very much for Thank your you. invitation. Just a final uh, word I would like to say today. Um, I want to stress that partnership. I think this is the partnership that we kept on our table 
a partnership based on values and a partnership oriented towards the future. Thank you, Ambassador Tryon Hristea, who represents the European Union delegation in Armenia. Thank you for staying with CivilNet. Uh, continue to watch live the last one or two sessions, two sessions, we're in the second, there are two sessions left, including the one we're watching now, at the Vilnius Civil Society Conference. And uh, we haven't mentioned this yet, but as you keep seeing on the logo, it's called Reality Check. It really is reality check time for a lot of us. Continue to watch, please. We'll be back to join you.